The fourth stamp of the season is from the Russian Empire, issued back in 1904. In the colors of blue and yellow, this stamp features what looks to be the Kremlin in Moscow in the center of the stamp, surrounded by a wreath with Cyrillic writing on both the top and bottom of the stamp. The top of the stamp reads postage stamp with the number 10, sale price 13 kopek, meaning that this is a semi-postal with a charitable contribution of 3 kopek. The bottom of the stamp tells us what this semi-postal is raising funds for. In use, Orphans of War of the Active Army. Definitely something that we'll need to explore in this episode. This is a mint stamp with no postmark or cancellation to explore. It is unused and measures 44 by 24 centimeters with a perforation of 12 by 12 and a half. Now this stamp was issued as a set of four, each varying in imagery and of course value. But each of the four was sold at three kopeck above face value for a charitable contribution to support war orphans. Now the goal of these episodes is to try and learn as much as I can from a postage stamp that I pull out of my collection at random. And my first thought when I saw this stamp is that it could provide a nice gentle introduction into Russian philately. It's got a nice image of the Moscow Kremlin and it's probably commemorating some anniversary. But I'm always wrong when I think that. This stamp has led me down a rabbit hole, learning about a history that I knew nothing about. One that saw the collision of the Russian and Japanese empires, believe it or not. Again, philately has impressed me as it always does. So let's get started. Let's talk about Russia. Russia is a country that really doesn't need any introduction. It certainly doesn't require a map to show you where it is or just how big it is. And its influence in global affairs, science, technology, art and music cannot be ignored. From its days as an empire to the Soviet Union and today's federation, Russia has always had a presence in modern history. When it comes to Russian philately, you can easily separate Russian stamps into three or maybe four time periods. In its simplest form, there's Imperial Russia, the Soviet Union, and the Russian Federation. But it's totally worth pointing out that one of the most interesting periods in Russian philately takes place between Imperial Russia and the Soviet Union. A short period of turbulent and drastic change that took place between 1917 and 1922. Now, Russia's philatelic history with adhesive postage stamps begins in 1857. At this time, Russia was an empire, Imperial Russia. It had been an empire since 1721, spanning so much land that it became the third largest empire that the world has ever seen. Tsar Alexander II was in power at this time, and he had put forth a number of proposed reforms that were going to modernize Russia. A postage stamp was not necessarily part of these great reforms that was going to help modernize Russia, but the stamp was a welcomed step in the right direction as other European powers had been adopting postal reform ever since the UK issued the very first postage stamp in 1840, the Penny Black. Russia's first stamp was this brown and blue design featuring a double-headed imperial eagle and two postal horns crossing below lightly embossed in white with a blue background. Unlike the Penny Black and many of the other first issues, Russia did not go for anything featuring an emperor or anyone else's portrait. Instead, Russia went for a rather ornate design that was used and reused throughout the 19th into the early 20th century. In fact, 20 different issues featured this double-headed eagle holding an orb and scepter, the coat of arms of Russia and the Romanov dynasty that was in power at the time. These coat of arms were used up until 1917. The stamps were small, elegant, and a delight to collect on cover or just on piece, or as a single and set of stamps. It's so elegant that it's currently being used by Russia today as an attractive definitive. Two Russian postcards that I got from Post Crossing recently came bearing stamps that are part of the seventh definitive issue of the Russian Federation that began to be issued in 2019. And they feature the same design, or at least a modern rendition of the double-headed eagle with the postal horns, which is the emblem of the Russian Postal Service even today. So with that in mind, this stamp that I pulled from the box, this 1904 stamp and these set of four stamps, I guess, are considered to be one of the first pictorial issues from Russia. Stamps that did not feature the double-headed eagle, but actually an image of something. And they are the first semi-postal stamps that Russia ever issued. 
We've discussed semi-postals in the past, stamps that have two values, a face value which contributes to the sending of mail through the postal system, and a sale price which consists of an additional value that is a charitable donation going towards a cause. Semi-postals are still issued today, and I buy them for example from the US Postal Service supporting a range of different charitable causes. Well, in this case, purchasing these stamps instead of the standard double-headed eagle definitive is Russians were contributing to the charitable cause of supporting war orphans. Each of these stamps are supposed to evoke memories of past Russian heroes. A sense of pride from 17th century heroes to the Crimean War, these were saviors of the motherland and were issued in December of 1904 during a different war, a new and fierce war against the Japanese. This was the Russo-Japanese War. In 1904, the Japanese and Russian empires clashed over Manchuria and Korea. Russia badly needed a warm water port, one that doesn't freeze over during the year and will allow the Russians naval and trade access to the east. And so they had their eyes set on Port Arthur. Japan, however, was not too enthusiastic about this, as they were creating a sphere of influence in Korea and Manchuria. Russia was looking a bit too expansion-y for their liking. So this was now threatening Japan's interests. These two empires were getting in the way of each other. Long story short, Japan offered a deal. Uh, Russia could have influence over Manchuria if Japan got Korea, and the Russians said no. So the Japanese surprised attacked the Russians in Port Arthur, and the two empires went to war in February of 1904. This war was in hindsight an extremely important and influential global event. This was the first time that the world had seen modern warfare with accurate firearms and rapid fire artillery on a mass scale. The industrial revolution had created new weapons that made the tactics used in previous wars absolutely useless. The concept of standing in line formation and shooting at the enemy now just exposed you to these modern weapons that would absolutely devastate your army. Neither Russia nor Japan expected the amount of lives lost on both sides. This was a new era, a glimpse of what the First World War would be like and how warfare had quickly changed. And while Russia fought on in belief that they would eventually win, they didn't. Japan won and became the first Asian power to defeat a Western Empire. Japan emerged as a global power, one that could topple the mighty Russian Empire and demand respect. This change in political landscape was massive. Suddenly, Russia looked weak to other European powers, a perception that contributed to the First World War and Germany's ambitions. And its leader, Emperor Nicholas II, looked weak to the Russian people. This humiliating defeat, along with growing unrest in the empire, contributed to the First Russian Revolution of 1905, which caused a shift in power in Russia. And although the emperor remained in power, it foreshadowed events that would completely change the country just 12 years later, in the October Revolution of 1917. You have to look more into this Russo-Japanese war, it's really interesting, and Russia actually lost a good portion of its navy after traveling halfway around the world to take part in the war. Also, the American president, Theodore Roosevelt, won a Nobel Peace Prize for mediating the peace treaty between Japan and Russia, which recognized Japan's influence over Korea and Manchuria. And that just set that history in motion with Japan's influence in Manchuria and Korea. I'll leave links in the video description, including links to other videos for you to check out. Now, back to these stamps, because they were issued in 1904 before Russia had its humiliating defeat in the following months. These stamps were supposed to portray hope and pride, supporting orphans of war heroes, and instead got associated with defeat and loss. I was able to find a cover with the stamps postally used on them, as well as a postcard with a very different stamp for us to explore. So let's check them out. This cover was sent from St. Petersburg via registered mail to Germany in 1905. A journey that doesn't come anywhere close to the actual Russo-Japanese war, but actually was sent during that time. The postmark reads the 2nd of February, which was a Thursday. This is a Roman numeral 2 for February and not an 11 for November. And so this was sent while the war was still on, which ended in September of that year. 
and on the back you can see that all four of the semi-postals were used. I couldn't find anything on postal rates from Russia at this time, but a total of 25 kopecks is being used for the postage in this case, with 12 additional kopecks spent on the semi-postals to benefit orphans. This was a lucky find to have all four stamps used on a cover. Now the postcard that I found is a Japanese postcard, it's an unused uh, Japanese postcard where on the picture side we see a photograph with some navy ships. The bottom reads, our torpedo boat squadron proceeding to attack the enemy. And this is I guess a philatelic item, it has a stamp and perfect postmark on it. This stamp was issued in celebration of the victory over the Russian Empire. A set of two stamps were actually issued in April of 1906, just differing in value and color. The image features a cannon with rifles, a trumpet, and other military equipment along with the Japanese flag. Now, this is on a postcard with a ceremonial postmark for the Naval Commemoration Day of the War 1904 to 1905. This is just really interesting. On the one hand, we have a cover from Russia who actually lost the war, and there are four stamps on it trying to raise money for the orphans of soldiers. And right next to that, I have a stamped postcard from Japan celebrating their victory. It's the same war, but different purposes for the stamps, the vanquished and the victor. Philately has captured both perspectives. Okay, so 1905 was a pretty bad year for the Russian Empire. It lost the war as well as simultaneously going through a revolution. And over the next several years, the empire continued to show distress economically and politically. However, it didn't show much change in its postage stamps as it continued to issue the Russian coat of arms on its definitives until 1913. And at this point in 1913, we started to see faces in celebration of the 300th anniversary of the Romanov dynasty, in which the serving emperor Nicholas II belonged, Romanov leaders were pictured on the Russian Empire stamps, which have a unique and fascinating contribution to philately. Just 10 years after the Russo-Japanese War, Russia enters the First World War in 1914 and faces terrible hardships that just amplify the empire's uncertainty. With riots and economic chaos, food prices soar, and Russia runs out of money currency was in short supply. So in 1916, Russia reissued several of the Romanov stamps in different shades on thin card to be used as currency. This is an interesting circumstance where stamps are serving the role as money. Check out these stamps. On the back of this Nicholas II stamp, we can see that it has a currency on par with silver money. This one is with copper money, and so on an intersection of the philatelic and numismatic worlds. Well, in 1917, Russia has another revolution. This time, Nicholas II has to abdicate in order to restore order. And so right during World War I, we see the end of the Romanov dynasty, one that has ruled Russia for over 300 years. And this next phase of Russian history becomes the most interesting politically and philatelically. Russia's National Assembly established a provisional government to hold power while Russia forms a new constitution and identifies a constituent assembly. But during this time, there was a power struggle in which the Bolsheviks of the Russian Social Democratic Party sought full control. Russia went through some major turbulence and changes. The Bolsheviks led by Vladimir Lenin took power and eventually a civil war broke out in October of 1917. And this war lasted four years. The Bolsheviks established this new government, the Socialist Federal Soviet Republic, and had to quickly put together a Red Army to defend it from those who were opposing Bolshevik rule, which became known as the White Russians or the White Armies. This was still during the First World War. Russia was fighting against Germany and itself. And while this white versus red Russian civil war was going on, a plethora of stamps were issued. The Bolsheviks first were issuing the old Romanov coat of arms stamps with overprints as they combated the continued inflation, but eventually were able to issue their own SFSR or Socialist Federal Soviet Republic stamps in November of 1918 that featured a sword breaking the chains of the old empire, a revolutionary image. But at the same time, and this is what makes Russian flatly so interesting at this time, each of the white armies were using or issuing their own stamps as well. 
These stamps came in a variety of forms depending on which white army breakaway government was using them. They were mostly overprinted imperial stamps from the former empire days. Some were extremely overprinted to the point of obliteration. The West Army overprinted Latvia's stamps, and in some cases, actual new designs were printed. As I've already mentioned, this is a fascinating area to explore philatelically. I'm just skimming over it at the moment, but perhaps we can visit it or revisit it at another time. Now, the White Armies had varying levels of success throughout different phases of the Civil War, but ultimately lost in 1922 making Lenin the leader of a vast stretch of land. And by the end of 1922, this Russian Socialist Federal Soviet Republic, as it was known by, began to issue stamps with imagery that was core to its policy and inward-facing appearance, a focus on the people, whether they were the worker, the soldier, or the peasant. This is one of the earliest sets of the Soviet Republic. One thing to point out is the initials RSFSR, what looks like PCCP with the circular symbol in the middle. Remember folks, Russia used and uses the Cyrillic alphabet. So what looks like a P is really an R, a C is an S, and that thing is an F. So in this case, it's RSFSR. This is what Russia was for a short time, because shortly after, Russia, along with the Soviet republics of Ukraine, Belarus, and Transcaucasia, formed the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics the USSR. And that, along with some additional member republics along the way, became a superpower that lasted until 1991. So this larger entity, the superpower of Soviet republics, issued stamps that were used throughout the Union. And these USSR stamps will have what looks like CCCP. Really, it's SSSR, Russian initials for Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Whatever you do, don't get caught saying CCCP. Someone will throw their tongs or tweezers at you. Probably a Russian. There are several online Cyrillic keyboards. You can put together the text that is on the stamp and then translate that text with an app such as Google Translate. USSR stamps are known for being bold and proud, and they were extremely propagandistic. They featured socialist symbolism, a portrayal of the workers. They also featured many of the accomplishments and heroes of the Soviet Union, most notably the successes in space exploration. The 69 years that the USSR existed saw the issuing of over 6,000 different postage stamps, an incredible documentation of that moment in history, and these stamps in their various conditions from mint to use to CTOs made their way into stamp collections everywhere. An earlier Exploring Stamps episode took a look at a really cool joint issue between the United States and the Soviet Union. These stamps were celebrating the two superpowers participating in a joint mission in space. Check that out if you haven't already done so. After the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991, Russia, as a new federation that no longer comprised of each of the Soviet republics, began to issue stamps again as its own entity. The first definitives being this simple and elegant set of stamps that feature sites and statues of the federation, from the statue of Peter I to St. Basil's Cathedral. The imagery since 1992 has still depicted proud moments and achievements and heroes, but has been far more moderate in pushing heavy political propaganda than the days of the Soviet Union. And Russian stamps, along with Soviet Union stamps, are really easy to come across, find and collect. Imperial Russia and the transitionary period into the Soviet Union are a lot more challenging to find, but not overwhelmingly difficult. You may very well have some stamps in your collection already. The only other thing I need to bring up, the final thing I need to bring up, is the imagery that's actually on the stamp that I pulled from the box. This is the Kremlin in Moscow. Specifically, the Ivan the Great Bell Tower, along with the monument to Alexander II. And so this gave me an opportunity to clarify a few things that perhaps I was confusing. Maybe some of you may have been confusing in the past. The Kremlin, or a Kremlin, is a fortified complex, like a citadel, located within a Russian city or town. A Kremlin consists of numerous structures and a wall that is built to defend the city. Actually, the name Kremlin means fortress inside a city. There are several Kremlins throughout Russia, 
But the most famous Russian Kremlin is the Moscow Kremlin, commonly referred to as just the Kremlin. Now, a quick side note is that the word Kremlin could also be used to refer to the Russian or Soviet Union government. In this case, the stamp is featuring the Moscow Kremlin with the two structures. And the Ivan the Great Bell Tower is still around today. Built in 1508, it has 22 bells servicing three cathedrals. Not to be confused with St. Basil's Cathedral, which is outside the walls of the Kremlin. This bell tower is within the Kremlin. And then there is this monument of Tsar Alexander II. This was situated in the southeastern corner of Moscow's Kremlin. Alexander II was best known for the emancipation of serfs in 1861, and he was the emperor at the time that Russia began issuing its first postage stamps. Tsar Alexander II was assassinated in 1881, and shortly after, this monument, which was pretty massive, was completed to remember his legacy. Well, the stamp is now serving another purpose. It is providing a window to view what the Kremlin once looked like, because this monument to Tsar Alexander II no longer exists. During the Bolshevik Revolution, Lenin had this statue, among many others, destroyed, as it represented the old imperial Russia that the revolution had just toppled. And it was actually part of Lenin's strategy of monumental propaganda, something else that I just learned from this stamp. Monumental propaganda is using visual monumental art as a way of propagating revolutionary and communist ideas. The Soviet Union decorated towns and cities with monuments to Lenin, Stalin, space achievements, and so much more. And while doing that, it had to tear down statues and any other imagery that conflicted with the socialist rule. This statue or this monument of Tsar Alexander II was a victim of this strategy, both because it was part of the prior imperial rule, but because it also made way for a different monument. But in 2005, a new monument was erected for Tsar Alexander II, and the design of the monument was partially inspired by the monument that was destroyed by Lenin during the Bolshevik Revolution in 1918. Okay, I covered a lot in this video, or rather the stamp has just taught us a lot in this video. So if you enjoyed it, please remember to hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already done so. And comment below, do you collect Imperial Russia, Soviet Union or Russian Federation stamps? And what other countries would you like to see covered in this series? Remember there are a number of links in the video description to learn more. As always, thank you for watching and happy exploring.